All right. Wow, you sounded so good today. Uh, I'm thinking about getting a bus, and we're all going to go on tour and uh, just be a blessing to everybody. Well, it's good to see you today. Uh, today, I'm going to continue in this series about a healthy home. We're, we're talking about how we can build the right kind of life. What does the Bible say about building the right kind of life? A healthy attitude, a healthy home, um, a healthy relationship with God, healthy relationship with your children, a, ha- a healthy relationship with your spouse. And uh, one of the things we want to talk about is the right kind of relationship with your money. And so today I'm going to talk to you on this subject, blessed money or how to get the most out of your money. There is a way that Scripture tells us that we are to deal with our money. Did you know that the Bible talks about money more than it does about heaven? It talks more about money than it does about hell. The fact is, it's one of the most uh, oft-mentioned subjects in the Bible. So why is that? Well, I believe it's because God understands that most of our life is made, uh, is spent rather, either earning, managing, or spending our money. In fact, I would say that literally 24 hours a day, you in some way are in relationship with that money. You're either at work earning it, you're enjoying it, living on it when you're at home, driving your car, eating your food, okay, uh, or you're managing it, you're paying your bills, you're uh, earning it. And the point is this, um, we spend most of our life dealing with this issue, this subject of money. And so if we don't have the right relationship with God and the right relationship with money, then the truth is uh, we don't have the right relationship that God designed us to have with Him. And so I want to talk to you for just a few minutes about uh, some of the things that the Bible gives us warnings about and how you can get the most out of your money. Now, this is not a message that says, hey, if you want to give, then you're going to be a millionaire by the end of the year, okay? Uh, I do not believe that. However, I do believe that God promises when you give, when you obey, He will bless you. There's no doubt. You cannot argue that from Scripture. God promises that when we put Him first, when we are generous, when we live by biblical principles, He will bless us, not just in life itself, but also financially. So there's no doubt about that. But today, we want to talk about how to get the most out of your money. In 1979, I was a 14-year-old boy, and uh, my family went to Yellowstone National Park. Now, I grew up in North Carolina, so we were a long way away from home, but it was very exciting. I was so thrilled to be able to go to Yellowstone, and uh, man, we saw the beautiful park. We saw the mountains. Uh, we saw all the geysers and the hot springs, and we saw the wild animals. Uh, There are so many incredible animals there in Yellowstone National Park. Now, there's a lot of dangerous animals. There's wolves. There are grizzly bears. There are elk, and I've heard that elk are very, very, very dangerous animals, especially the males, okay? Um, But the park rangers told us that the most dangerous animal in Yellowstone National Park is probably something you didn't think is the most dangerous, But it's the bison, the American buffalo. They warned us. They're unpredictable. They are dangerous. And do not get close to them. That's what they warned us repeatedly. And uh, so we were driving through the park. And uh, we pulled up next to this lake. And there's a beautiful meadow here to my left. And out in the meadow was a herd of buffalo. Now, being a 14-year-old idiot... I felt like my job, my uh, position in life, my purpose in life at that moment was to pet 
a buffalo. That's what I was put on this earth for. I wanted to pet a buffalo. So I start, you know, I kind of got away from my family, got away from my friends that were with us, and I began sneaking out into the field and with the sole purpose of trying to pet a buffalo. Now, I don't know if you've ever tried to sneak up on a buffalo or not, but it ain't easy, okay? Especially when it's out in the middle of a field and they can see you coming from a mile away. Well, anyway, I began to be ginger and, you know, tried to get through the grass and the field without being detected by the buffalo, not being successful. I eventually did get close to the buffalo. In fact, I got so close that I could smell their atrocious smell. It was awful. I got within 50 feet, and I'm like, you know, sneaking up. I don't know why I was doing that, but uh, I don't know why I was acting like, you know, you would on cartoons or whatever, but that's what I was doing. I was kind of trying to sneak up on the buffalo. I got within 50 feet. I kept creeping up. I got within 40 feet. Smell was awful. I kept creeping up. I got within 30 feet. Through my mind, was it was not registering what the park ranger said. Don't get close to the buffalo. They're dangerous. They will kill you. Okay? I'm thinking, I want to pet a buffalo. That's all I wanted to do was pet a buffalo. I got closer. I got within 20 feet. I got closer. I got within 10 feet. And I was reaching out my hand, trying to touch that buffalo, and all of a sudden, this big male buffalo, it snorts, and I thought it was going to kill me, but fortunately, all it did was run away. And so, there I was in the middle of the field thinking that I had ignored the warnings, and I had intentionally walked into a danger zone. Now, the truth is, That's how we treat our money sometimes. We ignore the warnings, and we intentionally walk into a danger zone. And we're just guilty of trying to pet the buffalo. So here's the question today. What buffalo are you trying to pet? I'm not talking about literally, obviously. But the truth is, we ignore the warnings. Uh, Are you managing your desires? Or are you just letting your desires go wild? The first thing you see, everything you see, you're ruled by your emotions. Nothing wrong with having good emotions, okay? But too often, we fail to have a plan, and we're dominated by our emotions. And what are we doing? We're trying to pet a buffalo. Or or maybe uh, you have not disciplined yourself to the point that you have a spending plan. Some people call it a budget. Now, I know that's boring, and I know that people don't like to do that. And there are some of you that you do like to do that. You you love to know where every penny goes. And there are others of you that your idea of a spending plan is spending $10 a week on the lotto. Okay, that's your idea of a retirement plan, all right? And you know what we're doing when we fail to have a spending plan, when we fail to have a reason for where our money goes and a purpose for our money? You know what we're doing? We're just trying to pet a buffalo. We're ignoring the warnings. We're sneaking into a danger zone. When we don't bring the full tithe, you know what we're doing? We're walking into a danger zone. We're trying to pet a buffalo. Uh, when we allow spending creep, you ever notice that spending creep can just creep up on you? I mean, look, I realize that inflation has gotten all of us in the past few years. I get that. And, um, but the fact is, if we don't heed God's warnings and follow God's plans, then we're walking into a financial danger zone. And we're going to reap the results of that. Well, let's look in Proverbs chapter 21 and verse 5. We've been talking from the book of Proverbs during this series, and here's what Scripture says, Proverbs 21 verse 5, the plans of the diligent 
lead surely to abundance. But everyone who is hasty comes only to poverty. And what he's saying is that you've got to have a plan when it comes to your finances. Now, I realize that that doesn't sound very fun to some people, but God's Word very clearly tells us that planning and diligence are necessary if we're going to get the most out of our money. Now, look, I'm not here to tell you how to spend your money. I'm not here to do anything like that. Uh, You can spend your money on what you want. But I do want to point out to you some warnings from Scripture that will help you be able to have some financial peace, some some financial stability uh, according to God's Word. Now, the word diligence means to plan well, to work hard, and to be conscientious. So he says, the plans of the diligent. Did you know that in Scripture, in Deuteronomy 6, 17, it talks about diligent people, and it makes a connection to those who are diligent. Because you can be diligent uh, just because you're a hard worker. You can be diligent because you're a good planner. And there are some people that are better planners than others. Okay, can we all admit that? Some people love to plan, and some people don't. Some people like to plan every moment of every day. In fact, some of you are such strict planners that you ruin every vacation that you've ever been on because you have to schedule every single moment of your vacation, okay? And then there are others of you, you just, you've never met a plan that you've even understood or understood why anybody would want to have a plan. You like to live life by the seat of your pants. It's fun, okay, no doubt, but it's often not the best way to live. So you can be diligent just by being a hard worker or a good planner, but there's more to this word when it says the plans of the diligent. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 17, it says, You shall diligently keep the commands of the Lord your God. So God talks about the diligent in ways that are beyond just being a good planner. Beyond a person that's a hard worker, because anybody can do that. But God talks about the diligent as those who follow God's word, who believe God's word, and keep the commands of God's word. And so he's talking about the people that follow God's plan, the people that live by the word of God. Those are the diligent, and those are the diligent that God blesses. Well, God gives us many financial warnings, and if we heed them, we will have blessed money, and we'll get the most out of our money. So, uh, just by way of delivering this message, I want to give you a couple thoughts on how to get the most out of your money, how to have blessed money. Well, God gives us warnings in Scripture about what to do and what not to do in regards to our money. Here's the first warning. God gives us warnings about the heart. You say, what do you mean by that? Well, as we see in Deuteronomy 6, 17, a diligent person follows and obey God's word, okay? Uh, So all obedience is a matter of the heart. You ever notice that? That when you obey God, it's a matter of the heart. If you've got children, you've seen this. You've told them what to do. And, And if you grew up like I did, Uh, you you hear stuff like this. My mom used to tell me all the time. Obedience is doing what you're told when you're told with the right heart attitude. I got so sick of hearing that when I was a kid. Uh, But it's true, right? And so obedience is a matter of the heart. It's like the little boy that was repeatedly told by his dad to sit down, to sit down, to sit down. The boy kept standing up. And finally, the dad had all he could take. He said, son, If you don't sit down, I am going to spank your little fanny. So the boy sat down and looked at his dad. He said, I'm sitting down on the outside, but I'm standing up on the inside. (laughs) And so it's a matter of the heart. When you and I receive these warnings, it's about our heart. Are we willing to obey what God says? Are we willing to trust 
God to keep his promises? Are we willing to trust that God is a provider? Are you willing to trust that God is generous? You see, and I've said this many, many times, and I'll say it many, many more times in the future, the most important thing about you is what you believe about God. If you believe that God is some tyrant in the sky, like the proverbial little boy with a magnifying glass trying to burn the wings off of a fly, if that's your vision of God, that he's waiting to blap you upside the head every chance he gets, that all he is doing is waiting for you to step out of line so he can bring the mighty smiting on you, then that's not a scriptural way to look at who God is. Now, God is holy, God is righteous, and God is right, but the fact is He is a loving God. He is a God that has a purpose and a plan for your life. You are not an accident. He planned you, even if your parents didn't plan you. God planned you. And so your belief about God and who He is, is about the heart. Do I trust that God is a generous and good God? Do I trust that He is willing to provide for my needs? You see, when I don't trust Him, then I, in turn, will not be generous. The fact is, I believe that God, especially in the lives of believers and the hearts of believers, God has put it in your heart, the desire to help the desire to be generous. I believe it is an innate desire. Even lost people, people that don't know Jesus Christ, we see recently with uh, the Hurricane Helene that came through and destroyed parts of Georgia and North Carolina. We see people from all over the world, all over the United States that have been generous and they gave to help. Now, do I believe that every one of those people that gave was a Christian? Probably not, but the belief that I have is that God has given you this innate desire, this innate thing in your soul that you are designed by God to be generous, to be helpful, not to live a life that is completely selfish and stingy. Well, why do we know that God has given us this? And what warnings does God give us about not having this kind of heart? Well, in the Ten Commandments, uh, have you ever noticed that you got these commandments about not murdering and not committing adultery and loving God with all your heart and uh, not uh, bearing false witness and not stealing? Big, big things. And I don't know about you, but the last commandment, it seems like it's a little bit odd. It's a little bit out of place. The 10th commandment, thou shalt not covet. Okay, God, I get why you say don't murder. I get why you say don't commit adultery. I get why you say don't steal, but covet? Seriously? Well, the problem with covetousness is that the root sin is dissatisfaction with God. When I covet It's because I am not satisfied with what God has provided. I am not satisfied with who God is. And I believe that God himself is not generous. So this idea of covetousness is really about your belief in God. Your belief in who God is. Now here's the question. Is it wrong to desire a new car? Or a new house? Or a new outfit? No. Not at all. There's nothing wrong with that at all. But covetousness is not that. Covetousness is being discontented with what God provides and envious over what He gives to others. You see, this idea of coveting um, can be really defined. There's nothing wrong. You're not covetous because you want a pretty outfit. I'm talking to the ladies, okay? So uh, if, guys, you want a pretty outfit, see me after. It's okay. We got another problem, all right? But if if you are uh, just desiring to be pretty or to look nice, that's not covetousness. But the idea where covetousness comes in is that 
I want to compare with somebody else, and I want to be prettier. I want to be better than. I want to be richer than. You see, the point is that when we are covetous, that we are discontented with what God provides, and we're envious over what He gives to others. Uh, Covetousness is failing to bring the tithe. You see, the tithe breaks covetousness, the grip of covetousness, in our hearts. And then I believe that covetousness also means that you become self-centered and stingy. You really become all about yourself. So, you say, Pastor, you mentioned the tithe. What is that? Well, a tithe simply means a tenth. And let me tell you where it came from. Uh, A lot of people say, well, you know, the tithe was under the law and uh, it doesn't really apply to us today because we're under grace. Well, that's not really true. Did you know that the tithe began over 500 years before the law was given by Moses? It actually began with Abraham. Now, if you study much about the Bible, you know that uh, Abraham gave the tithe to Melchizedek, who was a priest, about 450 years before God gave the law to Moses. Now, the Abrahamic covenant, and I don't want to get too technical here, uh, but the, the covenant that God made with Abraham was a covenant of grace. And he said, it is your faith that will make you righteous. Okay? So the idea of what Abraham was doing is he was bringing a tithe, which by the way, I believe Melchizedek, according to the book of Hebrews, was an Old Testament appearance of Jesus Christ himself. You say, why do you get that? Well, he's, talk, he's talked about the, the priest that didn't have father or mother, uh, and the eternal priest without end, and I really believe he's talking about Jesus Christ. The interesting thing about Mel- Melchizedek was when Abraham brought the tithe, which was the tenth, that was in that day giving a tenth meant that all of what you had was blessed. All of what you had was under the uh, guidance of that person that you were giving the tenth to. Um, I believe that uh, Abraham brought the tithe. And what's interesting is Melchizedek, what he brought. He brought the bread and the wine, which is interesting because that is exactly what Jesus brings, the bread, the broken body of Christ, and the wine, the blood of Christ, that we see in communion itself. And so the symbolism there is great. Now, here's what I want to say to you, and I don't want you to miss this. Because believers today are under the covenant of grace. You are under God's grace. You are blessed. Listen, if you are a believer, you are blessed not because of your works, not because of what you have done. You are blessed because of and only because of what Jesus Christ has done. So that, that's the covenant of grace, okay? So when you are a believer, you're not blessed because of the things you do. You're blessed because of the things that Jesus Christ has done. Now, I'm going to make a statement that you may not hear very many pastors make because you're going to be shocked by it. If you're a believer... You are blessed and under God's grace whether you tithe or not. Now, I know some of you are like, I can't believe he just said that. But it's true. And so here's the question then, why should I even consider tithing? Well, first of all, the Bible tells us to do it. That's a good place to start. But I believe that one of the primary reasons that we tithe is yes, God has lifted the curse off of you. Yes, God has blessed you. You are under God's grace. And because of your relationship with Jesus Christ, because of His work, you're blessed. Not because of what you do or don't do. Not because uh, if you tithe or not. And I truly believe that. But do you know that the Bible teaches us that your money, well, whereas you may be blessed, your money is not. In fact, what the tithe does is it lifts the curse off of your money. You want to get the most out of your money? Then through faith, trust God, and He 
will be the one that blesses you. Okay? So the point is that he gives us warnings about our heart. Why? Because it's the heart that makes the difference. It is the heart that makes us covetous or generous. It is the heart where it all begins. Here's a second warning he gives us. He gives us warnings about work. Now, we live in a culture that tries to promote the ideology that um, everybody deserves, you know, equal share of everything. I'm not talking about equality of personhood, but that equality of, of outcomes that if one person works and they work really hard and they become successful, and this person over here doesn't work, and they're lazy, and they don't do what they should to get ahead, uh, that both of them deserve the same amount. There's only one problem with that. That's not what the Bible teaches. I'm going to quote from the Apostle Paul in the New Testament. If a man doesn't work, neither should he eat. Now, I don't know about you, but hunger is a pretty good motivator <laughs> to work. And so the Bible is filled with verses, with principles about being diligent to work. So he gives us these warnings. Proverbs 14, 23, work brings profit, but mere talk leads to poverty. A lot of people talk about work, but they don't do it. So what does the Bible tell us? It tells us to work hard. It tells us to plan well. And it tells us to enjoy the benefits of our work. In fact, if you read in Ecclesiastes, it talks about this, that there are some that um, they don't really enjoy the fruit of their labor because basically they're lazy. And, and they, they really don't see the joy of it. In fact, you read in Ecclesiastes, uh, Solomon wrote, who was writing from a discouraged, depressed, secular point of view, and he kept saying things like this, all is vanity. Everything under the sun, work and everything, it's all pointless and useless. Well, that obviously comes from a person that doesn't understand what the Bible says about work. Did you know that the Bible gave work as a blessing, not as a curse. You say, well, what about in Genesis? Well, if you read it carefully, you'll find that God gave Adam and Eve work before sin happened. So the, the idea of work, it was a blessed thing. It was a good thing. It was a fulfilling thing. It was something that gave you purpose. And it was not until after sin entered into humanity, that the curse on work came true. And that's where God said, by the sweat of your brow, you're going to earn your bread. And so the idea that we should sit back and just wait on everything to be handed to us or given to us, that's not what the Bible teaches. It says, gives us warnings about work, it says, work hard. Be diligent. Now, um, that brings us to our third warning. It gives us warnings about our financial choices. Um, what does the Bible tell us? Well, it says to give generously, to be generous. That is being, I believe, like the Lord. Um, you, you've heard it said, uh, you can give without loving, but you cannot love without giving true with your children, your family. If you love someone, you're going to give to them, okay? So uh, he tells us to be generous, and I'll say this, and, and I'm, I'll, I'll move on to something else. Uh, if you're going to give, I'm talking about to the church, and you're going to be a part of that, let me tell you, there's three things you got to do. You got to plan. You won't give if you don't plan to do it. And the idea that you're going to give when you get ahead that's a losing proposition, okay? Because you're never really going to get ahead, okay? Uh, so you got to plan it. Uh, number two, the percentage giver, I, I say this because the Bible tells us to give the tenth. But the point is this, wherever you start, 
choose some place to start and see if God does not bless you. So be a plan giver, be a percentage giver, and the, then be a progressive giver. You say, what do you mean by that? I mean to grow in your giving. So wherever you start, start somewhere. But if you're going to start, you got to plan to give it. Proverbs eleven twenty five: a generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. Proverbs 19, 17, if you help the poor, you are lending to the Lord and he will repay you. So God, uh, he will not stay in your debt. When you give, God says, you're lending to the Lord and he is going to repay. He is going to bless you. Uh, what else does the Bible say about our spending habits? It says to spend wisely and create some margin. If you have failed to plan and all you're doing is spend, 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 you sign up for things, you're not even looking at it, um, then you, you're not really going to be able to create any margin in your life. Listen to what Proverbs 22, 7 says. The rich rule over the poor, and the borrower is slave to the lender. So the, the Bible doesn't say it's a sin to borrow money. Uh, most people here have to borrow money to buy a house or a car, okay? There's nothing sinful about borrowing money. But it does tell us to beware of going into debt, to pay off our debt. The rich rule over the poor, and the borrower is slave to the lender. Proverbs 3, 27. Don't withhold payment of your debts. Don't say some other time if you can pay now. And I think what he's talking about here is just spending money that you don't really have to spend. Oh, I'll do it later. I got to pay for this vacation. Or I'll do it later. I got to buy this outfit. Or I'll do it later. And what he's saying is don't withhold the payment of your debt or the repayment of your debts. So he says, spend wisely and create margin. Then he says to save faithfully. You want to get ahead? You got to live. My, my dad used to say this, and it's very simple. And it was not, my dad's not a financial planner, uh, but he's been very wise with his money. They had, and that my mom and dad both worked. Um, when they were 29 years old, they owned their house outright. No debt, no mortgage. And from the time they were 29 years old, they really have never had uh, a mortgage or a car payment. They've had one or two, but mostly they'd get it just for a brief time and they pay it off. Um, you say, well, how did they do that? They must be rich. Actually, the most money my dad ever made, he's retired now, the most money my dad ever made in his entire life in a year's time was $35,000. That was his highest salary ever. Now, my mom made more than that. Uh, but the truth is, it wasn't because they were rich. My dad used to say this. He said, financial planning is simple. Don't spend more than you make. And that, that's pretty simple, isn't it? I mean, and that's a biblical principle. You got to learn to save faithfully. Proverbs 21, 20. The wise man saves for the future, but the foolish man spends whatever he gets. So take that to heart. And then manage it carefully. Proverbs 21.5, good planning and hard work lead to prosperity, but hasty shortcuts lead to poverty. So plan. Have a budget. Live by it. Proverbs 27, 23, and 24. Know the state of your flocks and put your heart into caring for your herds, for riches don't last forever. It would be nice if it did, but they don't. And so what he's saying is you got to pay attention. Now let me wrap it up with this. God does not tell us to hate money. In fact, a lot of people misquote the Bible when they say, the Bible says that money is the root of all evil. That's not what the Bible says. It says that the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And that word love, it means an inordinate desire. It's greed. It's lust after money. 
So God doesn't tell us to hate money. Money is neither good or bad. It's neutral. It can be used for good or it can be used for bad. But God tells us that even though uh, we can feel neutral about money, we cannot feel neutral about God. And the point is that many people give money the place in their life that belongs only to God. And, and I really believe this. We get the most of our money by worshiping God and using money. But unfortunately, many people worship money and they use God. And so if you want to be blessed, then you've got to have the right perspective. Money cannot give you true contentment. You say, well, I'd like to try it. Yeah, I would too, all right? But the point is, if you're depending on how much money you have to bring true contentment in your life, you're going to be disappointed. Uh, money cannot give you real significance. Now, we tend to think that rich people are more important, but they're not. You're just as important to God when you're broke as you are if you're rich, okay? God does not place your significance with your bottom line. Um, money cannot give us real meaning in life. You see, true contentment, real significance, and real meaning, you know where they come from? They only come from God. They don't come from your accomplishments. They don't come from your bottom line. But they come from your relationship with God. Now, we are to enjoy God's blessings. Is there anything wrong with enjoying the money that God has given you? No, not at all. In fact, the Bible encourages you to enjoy it. But it also encourages you to be generous. And so here's my warning for all of us today. Don't wait for perfect conditions. Don't wait until the election's over. Don't wait until you get the raise. Don't wait until your kids get a certain age. Listen to Ecclesiastes 11.4. If you wait for perfect conditions, you will never get anything done. So God says do it now. And that would be my encouragement uh, to you because you do not have the promise of tomorrow. A number of years ago, my, my best friend, his name was Kenny Dent. And Kenny, um, he became a member of my church at the time when I met him. And um, we developed a good friendship. Well, I left that church and I went into evangelism. And a few years later, I felt God calling me to start this church. Okay? Now, Kenny never became a member of this church. But I'll never forget um, that I was praying about. He had heard that I felt God was leading us to start this church. And I got a, a knock on my door at the time I lived in Jonesboro. And a knock came on my door. And I opened the door, and there was Kenny. I said, hey, Kenny, what's going on? Good to see you. And he had something in his hand. He said, I just I don't have time to stay, but I just feel like God led me to invest in your church. He said, I want you to know I'm probably not going to be a member of it, but I believe that God's called you to this, and I want to give you the first offering. And he gave the very first offering that we ever got for starting this church. And I opened the check, and it was a check for $10,000. And I thought to myself, man, what an answer to prayer. And it was confirmation of what God was calling me to do. He said, well, why would you tell us that story today? Because... About a month or so later, I did Kenny's funeral. He and his family were driving to Florida, and he died in a car accident. And I, being his very close and good friend, had the, the privilege and the burden of doing his funeral. And, and here's what I want to just say to you as we close today. Don't wait. If you know now is the time to get out of debt, do it now. If you know now is the time to start being generous, 
do it now. If you know now is the time to start managing your money better, to start saving for the future, don't wait. Why? Because you have no promise of tomorrow. And neither do I. Heavenly Father, help us to serve you urgently with the understanding that we have no promise of tomorrow. And God, help us to do what we know to do, what is right, and to do it now. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Um, let me encourage you today, if you'd like to have prayer, we'll have a prayer team member up front, and they can pray with you. If you have a serious prayer need or just a minor prayer need, you can come pray with them. Maybe you want to be saved. Maybe you want to pray about receiving Christ. Maybe you want to find out about joining the church or getting involved. Come see one of the prayer team members, and they will pray for you, okay? And uh, let me encourage you to do that. Ushers, would you come? Now is the time we can give in the offering plays that passes. Please put your next step card in. And if you have uh, offering, once again, 95% of all of our giving comes in digitally. Uh, Kim and I give digitally. I, I use the, the app that I was talking about. Gave on my phone this morning. All right. So uh, there's a way that you can do that. So if you'd like to do that, then we really, really do appreciate it. Okay. All right. We'll wait just another second or so. And I hope, can you believe that it's November already? That it's already getting close to Christmas time. Yeah, I love Christmas. Probably my favorite time of the year. Not weather-wise, but I love uh, Christmas time. It's a great time. So, uh, all right. It looks like that everybody is finished. I want you to know that I love you. I'm thankful for you and uh, glad you are here today. And if you're wondering why I'm looking so ginger, I've hurt my back. All right, so that's why I'm walking around like a 100-year-old man. All right, so... Uh, but anyway, I love you. God bless you. We'll see you next